as a writer and a teacher of writing, I have often turned lately in the scriptures to and an increase my understanding of the power of words, the power of language, because as I've mentioned previously, I believe there is great power in language, and that by studying the scriptures, by looking at the way God uses words, that I can become a more responsible language user myself. Um, and so to that end, each week I would like to post a video about, uh, that I've called On the Mormon Vision of Language, in which I talk about some of my thoughts on language as inspired by the things that I've encountered in the scriptures. This week I want to start off with something from the Doctrine and Covenants section 121. This was given, or, uh, yeah, received in March 20th, 1839, or the written in March 20th, 1839, Prayer and Prophecies, written by Joseph Smith the Prophet. Um, it was a letter that he sent to the saints when he was holed up in Liberty Jail, which was just this, really a hole in the ground, couldn't even stand up straight in it. Um, and yet the things that he received there were extremely compelling, that they expand our vision of what the gospel is and of how we should relate to each other and build relationships. B.H. Roberts called Liberty Jail more temple than prison because of the things that Joseph Smith received there. So that kind of gives us an indication of uh, the environment that Joseph Smith turned this into because he was seeking revelation there. Now it, it, it wasn't always, it wasn't grand obviously for the prophet though. He begins uh, this letter by saying, O God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? He's pleading for God to come to him because he feels like he's been forsaken. And after this prayer, um, God returns this message to him. He gives him this revelation, these ideas about language, or rather about the priesthood and about how he is there with the saints and that they will overcome. Now at the very end of this, this section, uh, at the end of this letter, it talks about gaining power in the priesthood. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. Probably read that many times, and I'm sure you've read um, verse 41 many times too. Um, after saying that, it, that uh, we've learned by sad experience that it's the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Hence, many are called, but few are chosen. And then this, which um, uh, I'm, I'm applying here in terms of language use, um, but, it, but he says, no power or influence, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. But I think we can apply this, as I mentioned, specifically in terms of language use. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the acts of language, by virtue of the things we do with words, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile, <clears throat> reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy, that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death. And then also this, let thy bowels also be full of charity, towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. So I, it, it's, I've made it, I think I've made it clear that this, this applies not just in terms of um, the, the acts that we carry out under terms of, in, in terms of priesthood power and authority, both men and women acting in priesthood power and authority, but also in terms of the language that we use to interact with other people, that we should seek to be persuasive, that we shouldn't force other people with our words, with our language. Rather, we should refine our language. We should use it in ways that persuade others to do the right, to use their agency in ways that lift and strengthen uh, them and those around them. Our language should be long-suffering language. It shouldn't. We shouldn't be quick to judge with our words, with our language. It should be gentle and meek language. Um, it shouldn't be, again, forceful. Um, there are extremely forceful uses of the tongue, for instance, in profanity. Um, and our language should be language defined by love unfeigned, that we should reach out to others in love. The Apostle Paul said that we should speak the truth in love. 
Um, and there are lots of ways that we can use or that we can speak from a position of love to really influence and persuade other people. Our language should be kind language. It should be, uh, it should identify with pure knowledge. It should reach to pure knowledge. It should be built upon um, a knowledge of things as they are, as they really will be. Um, we should also reprove betimes with sharpness, but only when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Now, with sharpness, that can refer to the, um, it, it, it's not really, well, it can refer to in terms of speaking directly to a problem, but it can also be using the words of God, um, which are quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. So we should reprove based upon the words of God in the ways that God reproves. Um, and, uh, and again, by turning to the scriptures, we can find out what this means. But then when we're moved upon by the Holy Ghost, then, then our language should show an increase of love. And it should be faithful to those around us. It should be filled with charity. It should be filled with virtue. With, um, and, and I'm thinking of virtue here in terms of the whole character. That our language reflects the character of the person. And we should allow that virtue, our character, to come forth in our language. Um, and, and seeking always ways that we can say something maybe a little better, a little differently, so that we can really influence and connect with other people. Because that's, in my mind, what language is all about. It's about communion. It's about coming together. It's about uh, bringing people together in ways that lift and strengthen, that expand our ideas and our consciousness, that awaken us to the life uh, beyond this life, and, and really to the potential that we have here um, and our connections with each other. So uh, throughout the semester, I'll be posting videos uh, that show me, again, ruminating over, meditating on the Mormon vision of language as, as it's found in the scriptures and kind of expounding on the things that I've begun discussing here because this is really just only a beginning. Um, hopefully you find this enjoyable, that you find uh, making connections between language and the gospel. Um, that you find it enlightening and uh, useful and productive, meaningful in your lives.